Hi Year 10, we are back again on our next biology lesson and today we are looking at quadrat sampling. Now you probably remember doing this from Year 7 where we're looking at estimating plant populations across a uniform area. We mean uniform area, we mean an area that's kind of quite similar across the whole area, there's nothing different about it so you'd expect kind of a um, quite an even distribution of plants. Um, and we use the quadrats um, and we randomly place them and then um, we can estimate how many plants are in that area. So, time to get those books out, um, time to write the title. How can we estimate plant population numbers in a uniform area? So like I said, uniform, just like your school uniform, everyone's wearing the same. Um, in a uniform area, it's roughly the same everywhere. So here we go, right in the title for today. How can we estimate plant population numbers in a uniform environment? Now I've actually done another video on this as well because I did um, a video in 2018 that was looking at actually doing the um, practical, getting some data, showing you how to work with the data. So this video will just be a bit of an introduction and then you'll need to go on to the other video. I'll put the link on show my homework. Uh, it also will be the second, well, the video after this one on the um, playlist on YouTube. So you can have a look there. Okay, title done. So. When we're doing any kind of method, we need to think, is this method valid? Is it going to produce us valid results? We don't need to write anything at the moment on this slide. We're just trying to bring in some of that scientific terminology to make sure we understand what a valid method is. Because quite often in the exam, they will write a question like, um, write a valid method or a method that will produce valid results. Now it's about incorporating all of those features. Is it accurate? Is it reliable? Is it precise? Okay. Now what's really important with quadrat sampling is reliability. We don't stick to just doing three um, repeats, three quadrats. We actually do 10 to improve the reliability of our results. Okay. And within reliability, we've got two aspects of that repeatability I repeat the, the investigation and each time I get similar results and we've got reproducibility. Someone else repeats my experiment and gets similar results. And it's the and get similar results bit that's important because if every time we do an experiment we get totally different results, how do we know which ones to trust? Okay, So we need to get results that are very similar to each other to say that it's um, repeatable, reproducible or overall reliable. So if we have a look at this um, slide here and we guess the number of each plant in the field, probably lots of you now are going to pause it and you're going to have a little count of each of the things. And those tiny things that are scattered all over the place, they're actually ants. Um, and we've got bluebells and we've got poppies. Now it's quite easy to count the poppies because they're kind of um, less of them. They're quite bright, they're easy to identify. Um, we could go ahead then and count all of the uh, bluebells as well. It might be a bit more time consuming. But the point that we're trying to make with this is we can't go out onto, say, the school field and just count everything. It would take far too long. Um, it would, we'd probably make mistakes along the way. And actually, for the amount of time and effort we'd put into it, it wouldn't really be worth it. Okay, so issues with counting them all is that it's very time consuming. Issues with guessing, we could all guess very different numbers from each other and people's guessing abilities isn't always, um, you know, particularly accurate. So to get a more accurate estimate, we use our quadrat samples and we can place the quadrats at random positions on the field and then we can work it out from that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And people often say, well, why do we want to do this? Who cares how many plants are on the field? If we are, um, maybe we've got a patch of land and we want to keep that land as it is and a building company want to build houses on it. And we could say, well, actually, there's a rare plant living on this field. Um, so we feel that you shouldn't build any houses on this field. 
and they might then send in some environmental biologists who would come and sample the area to just work out how many of that endangered plant there is and then they can decide is it worth leaving the area or can they let people build in it so that's kind of a real life um, kind of application to the situation okay we didn't need to write anything from this slide but we are going to write some notes from this slide this is our summary okay so we need to write all of this down here we can see in the picture we've got a quadrat that is one meter squared okay which makes calculations a lot easier sometimes i've seen lots of different equations sometimes they're a meter squared sometimes they're half a meter by half a meter which means they're a quarter of a meter squared sometimes i've seen this question um, and it's a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter quadrat so it's tiny um, and we've just got to bear that in mind when we are doing our calculations okay and the one that i saw that was a really tiny quadrat they'd actually used it on a tree trunk so it was on the bark of the tree so it needed to be much smaller because it was a much smaller area okay and we can talk more about that later so quadrat sampling is and, and the quadrat is the frame uh, is used to estimate plant populations or percentage cover so it could be that we're looking at the average percentage cover across an area in which case we're looking at what percentage of each quadrat is filled or it could be that we're looking at actual numbers okay and exam questions will go either way with that you may get looking at percentage cover you may get population numbers in a uniform area and that is a similar area so it's similar across the whole area and it's too large to count so we can't just you know if it was a, a really small um garden or vegetable patch or something we could probably count that quite easily but we need to use this when the area is too large to count now placement of that quadrat has got to be random and we used to say that you could just lightly frisbee the quadrat and where it landed you use that and they're not liking that in exam questions anymore now they're saying that you have like a, a random number generator could be a dice you roll the dice and let's say you get a four you walk four paces you roll it again you turn 90 degrees and then you walk say if it's a three another three paces and you put it down but so long as you've got some way of showing how you get that random placement so you don't kind of go oh there's lots of the uh, lots of the endangered plants over there I think I'll put my quadrat down there or oh well I want the buildings to be built so I'm going to put it here where there aren't any so it, it avoids bias it makes it random and that's really important in quadrat sampling so make sure you've got all of those notes down um, about uh, I've worked out now that's the email sound so sorry about that um, Make sure you've got all the notes written down. If you need to pause, you can pause now. So here are examples of the plant keys that we will use. So when we go out onto the field, we will use these plant keys to identify our different plant species. So that's just there to show you. And then here is our table of results. And this is where it's gonna be quite useful in a bit to go onto the other video I've made. It's only six minutes less than seven minutes definitely and you can see where i've actually looked at the school playing field i've done some quadrats so i'm going to show you how to work with the data and i'm going to show you how to um, look at the actual estimates of numbers so we use a trundle wheel and we get the length of the field and the width of the field if it's kind of an l-shaped field then you're going to break it into two sections work out the area of each and then we've got the area of the field and we do our 10 quadrats, we put the number of each of these species and we've got gaps up here to add other plants that we find out there and we work out a mean of our 10 quadrats. And some people are really tempted to not include the ones where they didn't have any cover at all. So let's say they had like seven, eight, 12, zero. Then for some reason when they do the average, they don't want to include the zero. They want to divide by nine rather than divide it by 10. But we add them all up and we divide by 10 to get our mean. And then what we've got to do is get our estimate. So if we've got the area of the field, which we worked out with our trundle wheel, we've got our mean number of plants per quadrat, multiply those together and you get the estimate of that particular plant population on the field. However, 
The quadrats we use at school are only half a metre by half a metre. That's a quarter of a metre squared. So in actual fact, in one metre squared, we could get four of those quadrats. So what we have to do is this calculation and then multiply it by four to actually get the true estimate of the field. Okay, now that's difficult to get your head around. I'm going to explain it again. If our quadrat was one metre squared and we've got our area of the field in metres squared, then if we know how many mean plants there are per metre squared, we can then multiply that by the area of the field. But if our quadrat is smaller and it's only a quarter of the size, in order to know how many would be in a metre squared, we take how many would be in our quarter of a metre squared and we multiply it by four. And that's the additional point we have to do with our quadrats at school. And an exam question could go either way. It could be they use a metre squared quadrat, likely to be that on the foundation paper. On the higher paper, they may use a quadrat that is a quarter of the size. So then we have to multiply by four in order to get there. OK, all right, let's go on to. Uh, Could we write down this equation, please? If you haven't done so already. I'll give you a couple of seconds and then if you need to pause, pause now. So we're looking at an exam question now and this is kind of taking those ideas that we've already got. It's not a required practical, but it's applying it to that new situation. So we're going to think about um, what this is asking us, what we already know and how we can apply it to a six mark question. OK, and we're going to do that six mark question and then green pen it together. So ivy plants can grow up trees and walls. Figure one shows two ivy leaves. One leaf is from an ivy plant growing up a tree in the centre of a shady woodland area. The other leaf is from an ivy plant growing up a tree in a sunny area at the edge of the woodland. So the ivy leaf from the shaded woodland is big and the ivy leaf from the sunny area is smaller. A student makes the following hypothesis. The size of the ivy leaves decreases as light intensity increases. And that matches up with what they've said, uh, what they've got as their two leaves there. How would you use the apparatus, fancy word for equipment, shown in figure two to test this hypothesis? You should include details of how you would make sure the results are valid. That word valid creeping in, okay? So that means we've got to talk about being accurate, being precise where needed, and being reliable. Now the tape measure could be used if we were to do a transect line. And the next lesson after this one is talking about transect lines. So we won't worry about that too much now. We've got a light meter, we've got a ruler. Now we could decide that we're just going to measure the width of the leaf, maybe from here to here, or we can measure the height from here to here. We could decide we're going to take some leaves, draw around them on squared paper, work out the area, perfectly okay. Uh, our light meter, we're probably going to put that just on top of the leaf to measure the light intensity and then we can look at how the leaf has adapted. You know, is, is it a larger leaf? Is it a smaller leaf? And then when we've got lots of light intensities and we've got lots of sizes of leaves, we can then plot that and see, is there a correlation? Is there a relationship between light intensity and size of leaf? Now, light intensity varies across the whole day. So something you're going to have to consider in this for your control variables is when are we doing this? We don't want to start the investigation in the morning, then do a bit around lunchtime and then do a bit in the evening. We want to do it all at the same time so that light intensity is as controlled as possible. So like I said, six marker, method writing. I know that method writing can feel a bit tedious. We can sometimes, you know, get fed up with it, but you have to read it and think, okay, the person who is going to be reading this understands science, okay? But They've never done anything like this before. So you've got to give them enough guidance. How many leaves? How many leaves from each light intensity? How are you going to measure the leaf? What are you going to do with the data afterwards? Okay, all of those kind of things need to be written into this six marker. 
So start doing that now. You'll need to pause in a moment so that you get your full six minutes writing time and then when we come back, you'll need your green pen. So have your writing time and pause now. Okay, this is the kind of initial guidance. I don't usually show this, but I'm gonna talk through what it is. To get five to six marks, there needs to be a description of the leaf and the light being measured at different locations. Repetitions need to be included, so the fact that you're gonna repeat it. At least one control variable is described and mathematical treatment of the data is described. So the idea of graphing it and then seeing correlations, that kind of thing. So let's have a look at our mark scheme. I really hope that people have had a go at writing it themselves before they've done their green pen. So, like I said, we could have done the transect line, we'll worry about what transects are next time. So, they've gone with a controlled variable, keep the samples at the same height above the ground. So don't have some that are low down and then some that are high up. Okay, that's something you could have done. Keep them at the same aspect, so they're always, say, a north-facing leaf, you don't just switch it around because they'll have different amounts of light across the day. How you measure it, the length, the width of the leaves using the ruler or like I said you could trace it on squared paper and work out the area. Measure several leaves in each location, that's a good idea, so you've got one light intensity and you do several repeats there. Use a light meter to measure the light intensity and match that up with each of the different leaves, that you've, collection of leaves you've got. Repeat measurements of light intensity on several days. So what they're saying is, um, you know, kind of go back, get even more data to validate what you're saying. Uh, measure those light intensities at the same time of day. So if you're doing it over several days, maybe always do it at 12 o'clock, something like that. Uh, calculate a mean for each location, just like we did on the um, quadrat sampling. We did lots of repeats and then calculate a mean. Um, and we don't take anomalies out of this because we assume that we've measured correctly and the leaves are there, so we don't tend to take anomalies out, we just kind of go with it. And then plot a graph of mean leaf length or area or width, or whatever you've got, versus light intensity. Okay, so that's the mathematical um, use and graphical representation. So I'll leave that there for a second. So you've got your six marker. It's slightly different from what we imagined, but it's going along the same lines. Remember, we've got 40% in that exam for the triple students where it is application to new situation. So you are going to get stuff where you think that's not quite what we covered in class. That's why we bring in these exam questions to try and, um, you know, predict future questions and how we could answer them. OK, if you need more time to green pen, pause now. So I'm just going to move on quickly just to show you that this is what the uh, required practical placemat looks like for sampling techniques. So we've put our data in there. We've got data about how we um, look at the area of the field and stuff like that. Um, and the other side, so we've got a bit of area there for the method, risk assessment, don't throw the quadrat at someone's head. And then the um, other side of this is looking at transect lines. And that's what we're looking at next lesson. So I think, let me just have a look. I think we are covered for this week now. Yeah, so we've done our quadrats. That gets all the groups to exactly the same point for this week. So Monday, I will have on um, YouTube and on Show My Homework, the lesson on transect lines. I really hope you're enjoying this. I hope it's giving you a slightly different way of getting the lesson. I hope it feels like it is um, a real lesson. Uh, hit subscribe so that you can see when I update things. Um, and also don't forget to have a look at the next video, uh, the one after this in the playlist. I'll put the link up and it is how I actually collected data using the quadrat. You can see all the equipment I used, how I worked with the data, and it might help to consolidate the ideas. Have a great day, sun is shining, get outside, um, and thank you for listening.